Hi, how's everyone doing? Good, welcome, welcome. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, my name is Dan Pearson. This is the panel on how to build an engaging release plan or marketing plan. Um, so just a few things to outline before we get started. First, obviously to build an engaging release plan, there are so many different parts of it that we're not gonna be able to cover everything here today. Um, we're gonna try and touch on what we feel are the most important topics. Um, but obviously, we're happy to continue the conversation individually with you guys afterwards and, and further on after that. Um, we're gonna leave about 10 minutes at the end for any questions that anyone has. There'll be a microphone that you can kind of come up and just ask us questions, so we'll make sure we, we do that at the end. Um, and obviously, the panel's gonna be geared towards independent releases. So, you know, what does an engaging release strategy look like for an independent artist um, is really gonna be our focus. So. Uh, we'll do some quick intros and then we'll get right into the discussion. Um, my name is Dan Pearson. I'm the founder of Lakeside Entertainment Group. Uh, we are a management company, uh, talent management, and also label services. And we offer uh, a range of different label services that you would get at any label to individual artists, ranging from developing artists to uh, household names. Um, and I'd like to pass it now to Blair to give a little intro. Hi, my name is Blair Clark, and I founded and run Brooklyn Basement Records. Um, I'm an artist manager to three artists, Ron Pope, Miko Marks, and Emily Scott Robinson. And we also do artist services through Brooklyn Basement as well, where we run marketing and strategy for independent artists. Hello, I'm Mariah Zapp. I am the co-general manager and head of digital at Yep Rock Records. We're an independent record label based in Hillsboro, North Carolina. Um, I've led worldwide release plans for the Felice Brothers, Blitz and Trapper, Robin Hitchcock, Watch House, and a number of other artists on our roster. Um, I am on the A2IM Board of Directors and also the Folk Alliance Board of Directors. Hi, I'm Scott Manis. I'm the owner and founder of a music consultancy called Forward Group NYC. Uh, I specialize in commercial marketing, helping with DSP best practices, applying strategy, and uh, getting the most uh, marketing for releases on the DSPs. Hey everybody, I am William Tenney. I'm the founder and managing partner of a New York City-based uh, management records and services firm called Sunpop, and I'm pumped to be here with all these great folks. Hey, I'm uh, Jesus Trevino. I'm the lead for industry relations and head of Latin at Tidal, and at a f in a former life, I was a music, music journalist. Cool, so um, yep, that's a brief intro there of, of everyone's background, which we'll get into a little bit more. Um, we felt like we'd start with just an overview of what we feel like a marketing plan looks like. Um, and maybe Will, you can give a brief overview of uh, what a marketing plan looks like for one of your artists. Yeah, for sure. I mean, listen, I think it's a, that's a big question and I think the answer varies, but the, the most direct answer that I can give, especially when we're dealing with independent artists is, uh, I think about all label services sort of on a grid, all label services verticals as if they were sort of lined out on a poster board. And I think to myself, how can we occupy some space in each of these verticals, even if it's not super meaningful? And so for an independent artist, um, you know, an example may be, you know, you're looking at all these verticals and you're thinking, man, we don't really have like the prowess or the budget or the resources to fill the radio label services vertical, or we'll start with that, right? And and I think uh, the answer to that is you don't need to do something me super meaningful in each space. Uh, it could be as simple as working with a local station, a college station, doing a ticket giveaway, something that pretty much anyone can do that everyone has access to. Uh, and I apply that sort of strategy to each label services vertical uh, so that we're hopefully uh, making noise in all the right places. Cool, yeah, getting like momentum in some of those areas can start to bring some. Yeah, you know. I mean, j just like I said, do doing something. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, as significant as the way that a major label would do it, but um, just having some activity in every space. Yeah, and that's actually an interesting thing that you're saying because, you know, doing something, which sounds very simple, but I feel like so many people get stuck on where do I start? And you just want to kind of, no matter how small the win is in the beginning, 
try to get the ball rolling, and that'll lead to something else, which then leads to something else. Um, Mariah, I know you have an interesting way when you start projects to uh, do like a digital audit of figuring out you know, what an artist needs, where you start. Do you want to talk about that for a moment? Yeah, so when we start a campaign, we do two different things. So we do a, an audit. So we'll look at an artist's digital profiles. We'll look at what their audience looks like on social media. We'll look at what streaming looks like and what that audience. Sometimes we look at previous sales history, previous press coverage, radio play, um, even sync. And we take all of that data and we put it into an audit. And our project managers use it as a way to define maybe the areas of focus and set goals for the campaign, right? So like, if we're working with a developing artist, their numbers are going to look very different than someone who's more established and who we've done multiple records with. And so for us, there isn't a one size fits all marketing plan. We are creating unique marketing plans for both each artist, but also each record. And I think it's important. We sort of take a foundational snapshot, right, of like where we are when we get a record delivered before we start putting pen to paper and creating a marketing plan. We sort of have to ask ourselves, okay, where are we now? What are the goals? What areas are we focused on based on sort of like the initial reading of the metrics? And then we start talking about Okay, we're going to bring external team members on. I feel like we can't even get to that point of the conversation until we sort of see what we're working with in terms of like the data, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And after you break down all the data, obviously one of the biggest things these days everyone talks about is the DSPs. How are we going to release you know, this music to the DSPs? How are we going to get the most return? How are we going to get the most exposure? Um, Scott, maybe you want to jump in on, on that and talk about DSPs yep. a little bit and how you get started there. would love to. Um, I definitely agree on the buckets um, and, and looking at it and just doing something, um, whether or not you feel you're putting your best foot forward or have the budget, but at least just touching it and moving that inch along. Um, I personally feel that the biggest part in launching a project is obviously finding the target audience, but just knowing your brand and real narrative and story um, and once that story, hopefully authentic, is in place, you kind of work backwards from that and you develop drivers, try to go back in, refill those buckets and really hone in on it and create just timelines with temples that resonate back to this story and narrative. And with that, I feel like you'll pull in fans that want to hear it. It's basically like, you know, the trailer to the movie in a sense. Um, every song, if you will, is almost like the chapter to it, and you want to pull them in piece by piece, and hopefully you can um, exercise just marketing around each one and pull in more fans, and you never know what each of those moments or attempts do. Um, it's like an inch, and it could slide into something else. Uh, for example, uh, I'm working with an artist right now, and um, his, uh, his father just got released from jail, and he is has been, he's a producer, and he's been creating beats for his father to get out of jail, and that has been the consistent narrative now for two months. And they are now um, in the studio together, they're putting out songs, and they're flooding socials, and every piece of digital area with just content of working together in the father-son relationship. And fortunately, it has um, reached DSP level, and interests, and now we are um, engaging in campaigns with them. But the, but the point is he stayed true to it and consistent with it, so much so that we even moved the album around, so it's gonna be coming out now uh, this Friday, which is Father's Day, and kind of doubles down on that theory. And it, we're just sticking with it through and through. And the message, I feel, then just gets heard. So to sum up, I feel narrative yeah. is, a, is a big yeah. piece of every artist, should be a big piece of every artist. Uh, marketing plan. Who, who's the artist? Uh, Hip Boy. Oh, yeah. Oh, nice. nice. Yeah, so be on the lookout for Hip Boy coming out this Friday. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. nice. nice little plug. Super Drown Volume 2. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's definitely, uh, you touched on some great stuff there, like the, the having a, a, a message, a clear message, the content creation. Um, you know, obviously that's super important, not only for the DSPs, but in social media as well to kind of, you know, build a base and activate your fans. Um, Blair, I know you're, you're great at that uh, with your artist, Ron Pope. Yeah. Um, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So um, with Ron or any of the artists that I work with, I think the, the first thing that we do is we think about how much 
how can we inject that artist into this marketing plan so there is the authenticity. It does feel like there's a real person because obviously, you know, the point of marketing is to get fans. And what do fans want? They want to feel like some sort of connection. And so if you are not figuring out how are we actually making this artist, this person, pulling all these little, their personality traits, what they're into, how can we pull that into every little aspect of this? And so during the content creation for Ron's latest record, it's called Inside Voices, and he recorded it um, on Long Island on, uh, on the bay. And it was around a lot of wineries, and he went through, he, he wrote it after a really traumatic time in his life. And so instead of, you know, making it, you know, very, you know, sad or, you know, it, it, we, di we didn't really focus on that. We focused on what was the point of the record. And so we decided to build a world around the dining room table. And so we figured out ways to, you know, um, bring that into all sorts of imagery. Um, the, the table was the forefront of the, the album um, artwork. We put it into the canvas on Spotify. Every visualizer focused on a different item. Um, we're doing, we decided to incorporate wine nights with his fans. And so he has a Patreon where he does wine nights and they get to hop on Zoom. They have wine, they talk about a song, whatever. We just figured out all these ways that we could incorporate him as a person to like form the real connections. And that's what really makes the difference at the end of the day. Awesome. Yeah, that, that's some really great points. Um, I mean, as far as like social media, it is such a job these days. I mean, it's a full-time job for these artists to post sometimes on their own. I mean, I know for us, we, you know, have a whole department of just posting stuff for artists. I mean, you guys have any strategies that you've used with different artists to kind of keep them on a schedule, engaged? Like, I know that can be like a big thing for artists to get burned out uh, in posting stuff and creating content. Um, you know, maybe Will, you, you might have uh, some advice on that. To be honest, yeah, I don't. No, <laughs> it's, it's really hard, and they're really tough. But I know that they do probably. Yeah, it is, it is a real problem. I mean, I think that's why you know a lot of the companies like ours and and you know up here, we have a whole area that can kind of just focus on, like we were saying, creating that content. But then once you have the content being able to like get it out to fans on a consistent basis and make sure that it's like, you know, feeding the right algorithms and you're posting enough and consistently so that you're kind of, you know, in people's face all the time, which can be a real challenge. Um, but as far as like algorithms and kind of shifting from like socials and posting to back to the DSPs for a minute, Jesus, I'd be really interested to hear from I, a title. I would say, yeah, standpoint. I wanted to say something about that. Yeah. So do the research and, I would say look at whatever genre you're in, look at who the genre leads are for every DSP, and then start tagging them. I know it might be annoying, but I get tagged and I go through my messages like, I would say like at least every, I would say once or twice a month, um, and just start tagging them. Tag, but also, and also if you were listening to a title or Spotify, Set, the simple thing is like send a Spotify link or send a title link. Don't send me a YouTube link if I'm working on a title. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, definitely like start, you know, it's sort of like when I, I it's, you know, think about when I was a journalist coming up, I would call the editor every other week and be like, hey, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? And then until, until finally they gave me a story. So it's all about persistence. And you'll eventually, if the music is good, you'll get there. You'll get in a playlist. You'll get, you know, opportunities. So. What do you guys look for at title? Like when you're looking to champion an artist, is there anything? It starts with quality. It starts with the, the music first. We're no AI in us. Like all our curators are listening to all the music. Like, you know, I would say on average, each curator is listening to about 250 songs a week, maybe more, not including albums. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really where it starts. It starts with the quality and then it doesn't matter the size. It could be on a major, it could be an indie, it could be, you know, have 300 followers. If we want to get behind this artist, we'll get behind this artist. Um, for example, I can give you an example of on the Latin side with Fade, this artist Fade, he's, he was signed to a major, he signed to a major but he wasn't, he was on the subdivision of UMLE. And I was so putting playlists to him, doing content with him six years ago. So much so that my wife was like, why are you doing so much with this guy? No one is talking about him, except for you. I'm like, there's something about him. And now he's on the tail, uh, he's on a, the, you know, right behind Bad Bunny, as far as like notoriety, and like, he's getting there. And also with him, like going back to the strategy, he ended up, it ended up being a color, a neon color. and. 
everyone to go, that goes to his shows wears neon colors. I ended up going with neon sneakers mm-hmm. just to go with the theme. So, yeah, I mean, quality over everything, right? Yeah, so. absolutely. I mean, so, so much emphasis these days. We were kind of uh, all talking up here about how so much emphasis really is put on the DSPs, which makes a lot of sense, obviously, for where the world is and where the business is but that there are so many areas of traditional marketing still that you know you can do so much groundwork to get to a place before you're putting the music out or after you put the music out how are you supporting that release that you put out so it's not just like living out online and no one's streaming it and no one's looking at it because i know you know feel free anyone to jump in but there's a lot of times you know we'll have situations where artists come to us before we start working together and they'll say we put something out you know, we put it out, it has a thousand streams or something, and we moved on to the next thing. And then they just feel like continually putting out music and waiting for something to like explode is going to be the plan. And kind of the point of the panel really is that that's not really the plan. I mean, of course, everyone could hit the lotto and that would be great. But like, you know, you want to make sure you're putting in the work and have a, a real marketing plan so that you give yourself the best chance to win. So let's talk for a second about some of like the traditional marketing stuff that we all do um, to support the DSPs. Uh, you know, Will, maybe that's a good area for you to jump in. I know you do like a lot of marketing. Your band quarters of change has had a, a really big year, a lot of touring. Um, maybe talk about that for a second. Yeah. I think, listen to your earlier point, my feeling is like the, the way that independent organizations release records is inherently different than the way majors release records for a number of reasons, but mainly because of economics, right? Like independent organizations, which I, I think m- most of us here are, are from, uh, can't afford to throw something out into the ether and then forget about it seven days later if it doesn't work. Uh, at least I can't. I don't know. Maybe you guys are in a different situation. Um, majors, collectively, uh, I have no strong feeling about them. I think they have their place, but they collectively each own about a third of the world's recorded music. And so uh, that's a lot of money. And so um, they can sort of, uh, and, and they do some artist development, but they can afford to rapid fire releases and see what sticks. And then, you know, the, the one or the two or the 3% pays for the 97 that doesn't work. Um, so, you know, I think we're up here talking about a number of ways to support independent releases, but I think uh, to, you know, to speak to your first point, that's worth recognizing. Um, there's a lot of different ways to support records long term. Uh, one of my favorites is through uh, good old fashioned traditional digital marketing. I feel like it's not talked about enough. It's like magic. It's amazing. It's like one of the best tools that exists, I think, to independent organizations. You can profile a customer and tell the data giants of the world that you want to find more of them and put a price on those people. That is crazy valuable. So, um, you know, if, if, like you're saying, Dan, if you've put a song out recently, you're sitting one month out and it's streamed a few thousand times and you're, you're bummed about that. Uh, I would definitely throw that in the toolkit. Smart. What about, um, Mariah, what about you? You Yeah, I was just going to chime in and say, we always tell our artists, playlisting is not a marketing plan. Like they'll always come back to us and be like, I didn't get on New Music Friday. And it's like, okay, did you update your profile photo on Spotify? Did you upload a canvas? Like there are so many things that the DSPs would call best practices that are just like free for us to do. And so we make it a point to do all of those things. So when we're going to, when I go to my Pandora rep and say, hey, I have this new song, I can say, we've booked liners around the track and we're doing a featured song on Amazon. I can say, we booked a spotlight and we're doing Ask Alexa videos or whatever. So we always make sure that we have those sort of free best practices implemented. So then when we don't have playlisting, but we do all of the things we need to do to get playlisting, then I can go to our rep and say, okay, what happened? Here are all of the screenshots of us promoting on socials. Here is where we've done X, Y, Z. And then I feel like they will entertain the conversation. I think if you go to Spotify and say, why didn't we get on a playlist? They're going to rattle off all of the things that you didn't do. So make sure that you're doing those things to begin with. Yeah, absolutely. Just just to echo that also, I think think it's worth, when you're speaking with your artists about what they're goals are um, 
I guess, in terms of the DSP vertical, uh, having like a really honest conversation with them. And so, you know, your artists say, listen, like I, playlists are great and I still want them. Please don't stop giving them to my artists if you're in the audience. Um, but like you, sh you ask the artist, well, what do you want? I want playlists. Okay, why do you want playlists? Well, I want my music to be consumed. Okay, well, any... 90% of organic consumption or algorithmic traction is going to be 10 times more powerful yeah. than any programming you would ever be on. And if you go and you look at a really healthy artist's streaming consumption data, you'll see that a super healthy one will be 50 to 60, 70% consumption from library, 10, 12% from editorial programming. So I think it's worth just having an honest conversation about how to attain the things that you want and what it is that they actually want because playlists themselves most of them are not super impactful there are a few that are very impactful but most aren't that's a good point um scott you want to jump in for a minute i know that you know the dsp area is a big uh, area that you focus on as far as like all the things that you can do you know surrounding the dsps things that they look for you know that they'll bring up to you kind of like what mariah was saying about asking you the checklist of did you do X, Y, and Z uh, before you kind of go to the DSPs? Yeah, uh, I think everyone actually here is dropping gems that, that should all be applied and you, you hope to do that. Um, something though that I, uh, I guess that's another piece of it that I feel that helps you cut through the clutter, which I think is the name of the game, um, is consistency. Um, sure, it's, you can't just drop something and move on two weeks later. But the goal is to show that you're in it. Um, there are a lot of artists, since there are no barriers anymore to releasing music, that just kind of come and go, if you will, and aren't really vested and don't have skin in the game. And I feel that the DSPs are looking for an artist with a plan that has skin in the game, with the team, if you will, that has thought it out and created plans. And that also does include not rushing your release and having it delivered timely being at least three or four weeks prior to um, the drop date. But uh, consistency is a major, um, uh, I guess you could say adjective, in my plans that goes along with narrative because sooner or later, if you're doing and sticking with a plan, something's going to give. And whether or not it does on the side you expected, the fact that you have something to constantly come back to DSPs to talk about is going to increase your chances so much more than if you had nothing or if you don't stick in the game. So the goal is to just create, try to create these moments because then you then afford yourself an opportunity to repitch um, your music and yeah. to keep it going and then to also have that real plan with the marketing uh, um, that leads into an actual album release. And then even get, as soon as you drop that album, I hate to say it, get ready for the next album because it shows that you're really committed to the career of it and that you're here to stay and that it's worth the DSP uh, editorials or points of contact, whoever, to really like kind of look at you and to maybe want to form the relationship because it shows that you are serious. So aside from the narrative, I definitely want to leave consistency on there. And just to add to that, like definitely, oh, sorry. Oh, Go ahead. I was just going to say, I just want to add that our marketing plans don't end on release day. We have, we have a whole plan that goes through the end of the year. We put out an album two weeks ago. But to that same point, we just got a playlist ad for this album, you know, yesterday. And it wasn't on release day, but, you know, we had enough to where we could co go back and say, oh, you know, was this missed? And you do have to think about it in terms of DSP editors. Are, there are, I think the re most recent figure was like 120,000 songs every single day get uploaded to these, these platforms. And so they could miss it. And it, you know, we, that is we do miss it. <laughs> very conceivable. <laughs> and so, yeah, the point is like, you can have the best relationships in the world, but sometimes things are just going to get missed. And so the point is to keep having these, yeah, these moments, like keep having, like maybe there's a spike on TikTok, maybe there's something with touring, something to just build the story and bring them. I mean, and that's that's just the way that we've had the most success. Yeah, yeah. And no, and, yeah I was just saying to your point, let, I always tell artists, let the song breathe. Yeah. Let it, like just let it breathe for a little bit. The yeah. song is dope. 
And then the next one is like, oh, it's not as good as this one. You should have let, spend more time on this one. Um, so yeah, it's definitely just let it breathe sometimes. And sometimes, like you said, when you, you don't always know where something's going to work, but when it does, then you can start to lean into that. And it's like, maybe it's, you weren't expecting something to happen on TikTok, but there it is for the taking. And so you figure it out and you rework. And I mean, honestly, the amount of times we've like thrown a marketing plan out the window is countless at this point. And you just have to be flexible and ready to move at any moment. And that's the great thing about being a part of the independent music industry is that we can be flexible. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, th those are all great points and something we were kind of, again, all talking about earlier where, you know, persistence and, and kind of like, you know, sticking with the plan and grinding things out is real. There's a lot of benefit in that, which Will, you said before, you know, a lot of companies won't do anymore. Um, I know our team specifically, we, that's our bread and butter is sticking things out. I mean, we, last year specifically, we had two breakout independent stories, this band Lawrence, um, and then this artist Charlotte Sands. And Lawrence, we started work, we've been working with Lawrence for a couple of years. We all heard a song that we really believed in and it wasn't like streaming like crazy, wasn't anything huge happening with it at the time, but we believed in it. And we started to work a little bit to some of these traditional marketing areas that we're kind of touching upon a little bit, you know, radio, press, you know, pitching sinks and different things. And we got a little bit of traction and then we got a Microsoft commercial, a global ad campaign, which changed the whole game. It was playing during the NFL playoffs and, you know, obviously brought in revenue to help fuel the project. We put a real, you know, major label campaign together to go to radio. We had a big record on the pop chart. So, you know, you never really know where it's going to come from. Um, Charlotte's story is a completely different story. She was, you know, that kind of took off on streaming and socials and, and really connected there. And then we kind of shifted to more traditional marketing uh, areas. So there's so many different areas that obviously we're all kind of talking about, but I think to circle it all back to how Will started where, you know, touching upon each of these different areas and making sure that you are one, connecting the dots in all of these places and trying to move the ball forward in each of these categories a little bit at a time. And then if you do that, to kind of, I think Mariah, what you said before, it's like you, you want to make sure that you're doing something and moving everything forward a little bit at a time. And eventually something will connect where you, you know, put more fuel in that one area and hopefully get a little bit of a, a story and momentum. Um, so we have about 15 minutes left. Uh, obviously we can still kind of go around and talk, but I'd be super interested if anyone has any questions, maybe we leave the rest of the time here for you guys to ask us some questions and get into kind of some conversations about your artists or your questions or that sort of thing. Um, great. If you want, you can just kind of leave a microphone right there and come on up and let us know. Thanks so much. Um, so. But you want to give an intro, who, your name, your company? Sorry. My name is Jamie McRae. I'm the label director at Materia Music. We are a full service record label specifically focusing on video game music and managing the rights of video game music composers. And we also do a plethora of like cover albums because video game repertoire is one of those that lives and breathes and evolves. And there's a rich community around remixing and covering and so on. And of course that involves a lot of releasing original albums. And, you know, release planning has always been a big thing for us. But one thing I've noticed is sometimes, even if your marketing plan is, you know, something you think is going very well, maybe an album drops and its initial performance is lackluster. So my question is, what sort of post-release tips and tricks do you have if maybe a release is lagging a little bit, despite you kind of throwing a lot of different things at the wall? That's a great question. Um, anyone naturally want to jump in? I can give my input, but what do I you mean, think? Well, I think that that's a great, a great time to think about digital marketing mm -hmm. is finding those fans and the lookalike audiences. It really can be very powerful um, in finding, you know, some places that maybe were missed or some fans that couldn't, you know, didn't, weren't given access or didn't get access to it the first time around. Um, but I mean, for us, we always have like a continued video strategy that can be used in ads later, but also just to organically reach people. Um, that's something that we do through, I mean, honestly, months and months afterwards. And so, you know, you hope that these little things and keep, keep adding up. Yeah. If it's the performance or the initial performance that you're specifically concerned with, I think, um, 
I don't know how helpful this is, but I, I think uh, you'd want to focus on things that are needle movers rather than uh, perception boosters, right? So just like a basic example would be like digital marketing like we were talking about. That is a, a very, you get very clear ROI for your dollar in, right? That's going to move the needle and you know how much it's going to cost. Uh, I probably, I might not at that point, depending on who the artist is, spend $5,000 a month on uh, a publicist because that's more of a perception booster that might not move the needle as directly as you'd like if you're specifically talking about performance. Um, those are not black and white rules. That's just my hot take. Uh, if I th throw something in there, um, obviously just keep on putting yourself out there in whatever way you can and staying, uh, I guess you could say, nimble and current. Um, I ha And something that I had done with a artist uh, with it was a low lift. Uh, basically, I saw that Spotify was posting about Nina Simone's 50th anniversary, and he had a song that sampled Nina Simone. So we made a campaign out of it, rebranded his personal playlist to make it uh, Nina Simone or best of Nina Simone's or songs influence it. We put his song that sampled it up top, and then then we created that at that moment. And then I was able to repitch back to Spotify, allowed like a real talking point that we were trying to double down on their anniversary, and it just kind of opened up conversation again. That's smart, and that, that circles back to the, what we're all kind of saying, where sticking with something, the longer you stay in the game, the longer you give yourself an opportunity for something to come up where you can create something. Also, just real quick before the next uh, question, we, I don't think we talked about uh, like touring so much, but you know, to kind of touch on an answer t to part of your question, I think you know, maybe that artist is not in a, touring is a whole other conversation, but obviously getting out there to play shows, you know, any way possible, whether it's opening for a couple of dates on a tour or, you know, whatever city you're in playing the open mic nights in that city, you know, seeing if you could do an event at the local radio station, if there's a foundation partner in town, you can do a free event for them, you know, trying to just stay active, get your artists out there and organically, like we were saying before, build real fans. If you play in front of 20 people and you make 20 fans, that's 20 more people you can like activate to stream the music and buy merch and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, hopefully that helped a little bit. Um, yeah, we're happy to hear next question. Hey, I'm Abby. I'm the social media manager of Sub Pop Records, not to be confused with. <laughs> that happens a lot. <laughs> and um, you briefly touched on um, TikTok as like having a moment. So how do you throw out your marketing plan? What's like the first step? How do you get into it? Like into that? TikTok? Yeah. Or, oh, God. Because that's something that I'm always like, oh, oh. My gosh, Beach House is going off right now in Space Song. So what do I do? Oh, my God. Yeah. I, I mean, TikTok is such a beast in and of itself. Like, there is not a great answer. There's not a lot of guidance around it. Um, so I can't give you a good one. But I will say we, you know, we've tried to lean in, you know, where you do see the moments happening, lean into whatever TikTok is allowing you to do the duets, stitches, whatever. Um, and, you know, possibly doing some promoted posts around that, but kind of letting the fan lead. Um, that's where we found the most success is like letting them kind of take it. And then, you know, having the band be really responsive to the users that are using those sounds and, um, you know, elevating it more because a lot of times when we've had the artist, you know, we'll be like, oh my gosh, did you see that this, you know, got 20 million views and it used your song. If they reach out, they, those people are excited and they want to lean in. And so that's not a great answer. And I'm sure you probably know way more than me in this world, but I'm still trying to figure it out too. <laughs> We're all trying to figure yes. it out. Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Thank God. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, uh, I'm Matt Hall. I'm co founder of a platform called Show Up. And we are helping to create and support and scale activism in the music industry. Quick plug, we'll have a panel tomorrow at 11 a.m. where we'll be talking about how do we integrate activism into release strategies. Um, I think we all probably recognize that there really isn't anything more authentic outside of the music to artists than the things that they support, the communities that they care about. Um, an example of what we might do, Scott, uh, Hit Boys record coming out this week, um, Fathers in the Criminal Justice System, we might help you partner with the Equal Justice Initiative, create content, further amplify I love it. voice in this, and um, bring the fans along to support. Love it. Let's talk, please. Yeah, I'm here. Um, and I'll be 
at a panel at 11 a.m. tomorrow talking about this as well. We want to <clears throat> see that activism becomes <clears throat> part of the toolkit and is one of these buckets that we're talking about or ladders that we talk about that artist services, labels, management, distributors can turn to to help amplify artists' voice. So a question I have would be, have any of, have any of you guys had experience in the space working with artists um, who are trying to support a community, advocating for something that you've integrated into, into your release strategies? Thank you. I'll actually chime in really quick. I almost tried to steer my artists to become um, focused on that, no matter what it is, whether it's literally being from North Carolina and doubling down on Carolina, um, which we were just talking about before, um, whether it's um, uh, focusing on pride and, and really zeroing in and trying to make the most of it, even though there's something there, and just going to Pride Parade and performing, which actually led to a U.S. ambassadorship for Equal on um, Spotify and a billboard, just really focusing, because it's passion, right? So no matter what it is, it'll speak and it'll come through and it'll also draw in that fan because you're not trying to create it. Um, so I definitely want to sit down and talk to you. Um, uh, but I, I feel that every artist should be zoned in on some type of uh, point that resonates with them that is, uh, what would you call it again, the consulting service? Show up. Show up. But, but your specialization, just advise. Uh, one of the things we do is, is help labels, distributors, artists directly to integrate this advocacy. Ad, advocacy, advocacy, sorry, is advocacy the word I was looking for? Right, so, so any on advocacy on any level, yeah. um, whether it's literally the state they're from, to what they believe in, to criminal justice system, to, but um, yes, yeah. I, I fully agree on that. And then mental health too, obviously, is like a really big talking point for mostly everyone, you know, that we work with. It's just <laughs> such a, thing now that you know that that's being talked about which is great um you know the mental health month certainly we do a lot uh this artist charlotte sands that i mentioned she's a big mental health activist uh, activist she i think a portion of the proceeds from I forget if it was a tour or her merch or some some component was going back towards paying for people's mental health or that sort of thing so yeah so certainly like being you know socially conscious about uh, things that are important to the artist and giving back to communities and the fans that's a great idea and we always recommend that you know yeah uh, i want to say something and uh, the team that i'm a part of at title is called culture and content so we always put culture first a lot of us are former journalists um during 2020 we created a social justice page a hub with a lot of like protest music but also you know essentials for the last poets um you know speeches from mlk malcolm x um you know, what's super important for us, like, especially as coming from black and brown communities, disenfranchised communities, like, we always put that first. We even created a video series called Speak Up, Speak Out. Speak Out. So, yeah, super important. Thank you all. Cool. Thank you. Hi. Where I am? Well, well Dave. Hello. Studio, I hope to meet. Uh, what up, David man? Ecker. Uh, I'm from Acceleration Music, uh, doing label development. Uh, you know, this is uh, a little bit more of an nerdy step back from, from the really important stuff we were just talking about. Um, but, uh, you know, you've all talked, you all gave really good advice in terms of kind of building that initial exposure and, and getting that initial engagement from fans. I guess I'm just curious kind of how each of you view, um, how each of your process for kind of pushing a fan down that funnel to the most valuable action or action that they can take. I know everyone has a very different approach to that. Um, I, 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 yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll start, but yeah, I think it's, it kind of lends itself to the TikTok thing is you have to build or allow the fans almost to lead it and you can kind of help them organize a little bit before, so Ron Pope has been an independent artist for a really long time and so, but the way that I feel like his artist has sustained is because he has a very core group of fans that almost lead it for him, you know, like they organize fan meetups, they will do street teams, you know, and so it's like getting the, that core group of fans to almost like get other ones excited and so they'll do little they had like, they created t-shirts for themselves one time. They gave themselves a name. I don't know. It's like you kind of facilitate the place and then that, you know, helps people join. But that's. 
We we sort of let the data decide that. I feel like I tend to wear a data hat my day to day, but we're a record label, so my job is to sell records, right? So I feel like when we first announce a record, we use a smart link. I put all the links in my feature FM and what I'm driving on social media first is pre-order, pre-order the record. I want you to buy the vinyl. I want you to buy the vinyl. And then when I look at the data and I see what people are actually interacting with, if 30% of users are going to Bandcamp, but 70% are going to streaming, then I might pivot and say, okay, if, if this is a streaming audience, then I'm going to sort of change my social tactic and maybe some of my advertising tactic because I'm listening to what the consumer is interested in. And I know we will always have a buying audience, but for a lot of our artists now who are younger, it skews so much more digital heavy. And so, yes, I have to sell records. That is my job. But also, I feel like we're really flexible, and I sort of use the data to tell me who is the buying audience or who is the engaged audience for this artist, if that makes sense. D data is very important. Yeah. Good point on it. Um, hey, David, how are you doing? Um, uh, I, one, of the, one of the ways I kind of zero in on that is when I first meet with a client before I start consulting them, I give homework and it's, it's to basically come up with the pitch and, and double down on that whole story and narrative line. And we talk through it as almost like a therapy session of what, what the owl means to you, why'd you put it out, what your elevator pitch is, literally if you were going to tell someone about it, what the song is, why you went through it, like really get, dive into it and through those conversations. Um, whether or not the data proves to be correct with their target fan base or what they're trying to do, um, we're able to explore, and it gives us like a better picture of what is also more comfortable with the artist, which in theory would hopefully then hit a passion point and resonate more. Cool. Well, Dave. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you, you probably know, you know better than me, but I would just say like... Uh, creating a world for those fans to live in and monitoring the community and dropping Easter eggs and yeah. mm -hmm. creating a world for them to be in. I mean, when I, when I was working Fall Out Boy and Panic, like we had someone whose full-time job was essentially like community monitoring, was like, it, you know, on Discord, on Twitter, just like figuring out what the kids were talking about and prodding them. <laughs> well, I mean, nobody's going to create more fans like fans yeah. you know like you have to create a community that people want to be a part of it's like why people going to live like going to live shows is so special is because you see other people that are like you and you want to be more into it I don't know so I feel like it's like yeah you create the space and then you kind of allow them to run with it and then they teach you what to do I don't know if that makes sense <laughs> cool thank you so much all right well we got about two minutes left if anyone has any more questions all right, let's do one more and then we'll wrap it up. I'm Kayla with 30 Tigers. We release Emily Scott Robinson's music, which is phenomenal. Um, I had a question um, in terms of release planning regarding singles. We tend to, our artist managers very often like to put out like three, sometimes four singles before an album. Do you guys have any like thoughts or opinions on a sweet spot for like what's too many singles, what's too few? Yeah. Especially with DSPs, they're kind of like, what, what are your main, most important moments? Like, pick one or two that we will get behind. So it's sometimes I'm like, look, we have three more singles in between. Don't expect playlisting. This is just for the fans, you know. But sometimes I feel like we get a little bit too many. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, to, to start it off, I mean, for us, we really try to pick, you know, we listen to all the music or if we can. Sometimes you don't have that opportunity and you get one song. But we try to get as much music as we can beforehand so that we can kind of you know, plan out, put a release plan together really for the six months or for the year and what that's going to look like. And then collectively decide within our team and then with the artist and management and everyone involved, what are the focus tracks? You know, maybe of the five songs, you have one that you feel like is the home run, the next one that you feel is like a strong follow-up, and the others are good songs for different reasons, but not really the ones you're going to put a lot of, you know, money behind or, you know, be you know, hitting Jesus every, you know, five minutes about, about the, the song. So you have to kind of pick your battles. Um, so I think finding the right focus track and then staggering it in between with some of the other, uh, you know, releases is kind of important. And then building some of these things that we're talking about around that is the way to go. Yeah, I, I kind of don't like when, when uh, labels and distributors say, like, 
we're putting this out, but don't worry about it. It's sort of like, well, it's a piece of art, so like I should worry about it. I want to listen to it. So I don't know. It's like it's an interesting. <laughs> well, it's true though. It's what that's maybe that's the title problem. But like we're sort of like. I think, yes, focus tracks, I don't know if there's a good number. There is definitely a bad number. Like, don't give me 20 focus tracks. But, um, but yeah, I just, I think every piece, every single, every piece of music is a piece of yeah. art and it should be treated as such. So I think that's what, it's a great point and kind of to what I was saying. Like, you don't want me to come to you and say, hey, here are the 20 focus tracks. You want me to come to you and say, here are the two focus tracks. It's a great album. We're going to do, you know, this is the plan for each of these singles. You can't, like we were saying before, just put a single out and let it live out there on its own without anything. Yeah. So you need some of these elements that we're talking about, but you can't hit, you know, the DSPs or radio or, you know, press or blogs or whoever with, you know, these are our 10 singles that we're going to work. Like for us as an independent company and, and I'm sure everyone else, you know, we get a couple of shots a year with some really big things. So you have to kind of pick those things, you know, carefully. We typically do three to four. Like if I had to give you a number, I would say three to four. Something I've been doing a lot recently is having a single from an album go live before announcing the album. It's yeah. so like I'll have an album track go live as a standalone single as a way to just re-engage the algorithm, re-engage my relationships with DSPs. And then by the time we're ready to announce the record, I already have like current streaming data coming in to sort of help my pitch. Um, in terms of single selection, we always like to make sure that whether it's two songs or five songs before that each single sort of gives you a taste of what the record sounds like. So we like to make sure that there's like difference in tempo and like if it's a sad song versus like a banger like we we're really intentional about making sure that the singles you are hearing gives you sort of like a good snapshot of this is the sound of the record kind of thing but yeah i would say three to four yeah i would just say one thing and i think it is best practice but um not to give out more than half the album yeah yeah which some artists do and it just ends up all of a sudden you have only two tracks left on the album but <laughs> well thank you so much um uh, this has been a really great discussion. Um, we are out of time, unfortunately. We would love to continue the conversations afterwards here, or you know, obviously you can find us online pretty easily. Um, but thank you guys so much, and obviously thank you to the panel and A2IM for hosting this and, and putting this all together. Thank you guys. Thank you.